Love. A million and one movies, books, and songs have set out to define love. Some do it cynically, while others are much more hopeful. If we asked Plato, love is a spontaneous feeling of attraction that mellows into a lifelong connection. To French philosopher Alain Bajou, love is ultimately a quest for truth, where we answer the question, what kind of world does one see when one experiences it from the point of view of two and not one? Now if you ask a TikToker? Men tend to forget that women typically are emotionally wired or more emotionally wired. Respect to men is love. Like men don't feel loved if they don't feel respected and your job as a woman is to make them look good. Men are so simple to satisfy in a relationship. They only need three things in order to be happy. Sex, respect, and to be left alone. Men love women far differently than women love men. Men love women for real. Men love men for real. No, they don't. Men don't actually want relationships. You wanted equality and now you're complaining that they don't want to be in a relationship with you. You know I'll never be able to get a phone call from a girl. You know who trying to call me. Nobody, you know? I'm just tired. I'm just tired of feeling so lonely, man. Love becomes more of a game with hard rules for men and women to follow. And depending on who you ask, it might not even exist anymore. Is modern dating and the quest for love broken? Is love dead in the 21st century? A million years ago, dating used to be so much simpler. Cavemen would see a hot cavewoman and ooga booga their way into a relationship. If talking didn't win her over, then the caveman's club would do the talking for him. And that's how humanity reproduced, through charm or by force. Not your ancestors though. That's how it worked for the alpha cavemen who got to sleep with all the women. Your ancestors were stuck fighting over the cavewoman's ugly friend. A lot of people still believe in this story of prehistoric mating as the natural way humans pair up. The strong men, the alphas, they monopolize the beautiful women, and the average women, leaving the betas the bottom pickings. This is the natural way humans mate, it's genetics. You see, men produce way more sperm than women who produce none. So men are at an evolutionary advantage if they're promiscuous and try to pass their seed onto as many women as possible. In our evolutionary history, those alpha cavemen would get 80% of the women. Meanwhile, sex is riskier for women since they can get pregnant, and so they're less promiscuous and more choosy when it comes to partners. This leaves the average remaining 80% of men fighting over the bottom 20% of women. Today, you can't go around battering women with a club or fighting off lower value men to secure your mate like you used to, but the underlying logic of the market remains the same. Love, romance, it's all fairy tale bullshit. All relationships are simple cost benefit calculations that take place in the market. Sex, like food or water, is just another resource that can be sold. But we're not talking about sex work, no. Women and men trade and barter sex through a process that we call dating. Women, since they're less promiscuous, are the gatekeepers of sex. They're the sellers and men are the buyers. And so women use their bodies and sex to barter for all kinds of things. Protection, resources, status, all in exchange for the man's exclusive use of her body. While a sex worker who gets paid for sex is brazen about it, there's no fundamental difference between what she does and what a girlfriend or wife is doing. Think about the idyllic 1950s housewife. What was the nuclear family if not an economic arrangement? A woman's only way of attaining a middle class lifestyle by selling herself to her husband. It's cynical, but that's the argument sexual economists make. In accordance with the theory, sex has a price decided by women collectively. If women are too choosy, the price of sex rises, leading to men having to be more competitive by taking better care of themselves, getting better jobs, and being better partners. If women are too loose, they lower the price of sex, which is what happened after the sexual revolution in the 1960s. You see, before the free love movement, gender and sexual norms were incredibly restrictive. Patriarchy denied women any role or power in society, and men could find a partner so long as he could find a job. But with the free love movement, cultural norms surrounding casual sex changed, and the creation of birth control made sex a lot less risky. So young women were having a lot more of it with a lot more people. 
This lowered the price of sex dramatically, which depending on who you ask, might result in the collapse of society. Not even kidding, that's the argument this video with a quarter of a million views on the topic makes. With sexual pleasure so readily available, men are no longer incentivized to go out and get their life together, get a well-paying job, and make something of themselves. Now they can play Valorant all day and still get laid. And if they can't get laid, all kinds of pleasure is available online through the click of a button to satisfy those same urges. But do you remember the 80-20 sex split from our ancient ancestors? It turns out, lazy, slothful men make for bad lovers. And so we've returned once again to our biological mating habits. Look no further than Tinder or Hinge where the platform's own data reveals that the tiny minority of the most handsome men account for the vast majority of the matches. The result? A growing number of lonely, frustrated young men, incels. And as this legion increases, who knows what will happen? And the numbers actually seem to bear this out. Turns out, plenty of people just aren't having sex anymore. Between 2009 and 2018, the proportion of adolescents reporting no sexual activity rose to 44.2% among young men and to 74% among young women. Another survey found that one in four Americans hadn't had sex in the last year. Meanwhile, another concluded that contrary to popular media conceptions of a hookup generation more likely to engage in frequent casual sex, a higher percentage of Americans had no sexual partners after age 18. And it's not just sex either. In 2019, pre-COVID, 61% of Americans over the age of 18 years were lonely. A dramatic increase since the 1970s when rates were as low as 11%. There's a supply and demand mismatch in the dating marketplace. America is down bad, and if we don't solve this, the consequences could be dire. In the 21st century, love and romance are dead. And we killed it. An image of two swans, their necks craned together, making the form of a heart. It's a picture we've all seen before, the quintessential image of romance. Swans are the perfect subject, after all. They join the likes of penguins and other species of animals that mate for life. The perfectly monogamous creature. How romantic. Well, not quite. You see, swans do tend to pair up and mate for quite a while, but it's not uncommon for pairs to separate or for one swan to cheat on their spouse without them knowing, which is kind of heartbreaking if you're a romantic, if even swans are cheaters and leave their partners, what hope does that leave for the rest of us in finding our soulmates? Tracing the origins of ancient mating is tough, especially when you consider the variety of ways other primates get it on. Male gorillas have harems of female gorillas they get exclusive access to and defend to the death from other male gorillas. Chimpanzees, meanwhile, all compete and battle freely for mates, having multiple partners and letting the best monkey win. Bonobos, on the other hand, have as much sex as possible with as many different partners as they want. Tension building in the group? Eh, have an orgy to sort it out. Romantic love, the way we know it, doesn't really seem compatible with any of these primates. So was love always a farce to begin with? Well, here's what we know. Humans, as one outlet put it, are monogamish. When you look at the polygamous gorilla, males are twice as big as females and their canines are massive, which allows the males to assert dominance over his harem and fight off rivals. Human males, on the other hand, are only 20% bigger than human females, and we lost the canines for fighting a long time ago, so it's not likely gigachad men controlled harems of females to the expense of other men, at least not in the majority of ancient societies. Male chimpanzees, who have to share their partner with many other competing males, have these giant balls to store more sperm. The more swimmers they can shoot, the likelier it'll be their kid that comes out in a few months. Gorillas don't need giant balls since they monopolize sex with females that stay exclusive to them, so they got peanuts in comparison. Human balls are, on the smaller side, closer to the balls of the gorillas than the chimps suggesting some degree of non-competitiveness and exclusivity, which is a plus for the monogamy argument. 
But those of the radical anthropologist group suggest humans are a lot closer to the bonobos, and that group marriages were what we preferred. People's hair stand on end when you talk of group marriage, particularly in the West. It doesn't mean everyone is partying and having sex with everyone else. It means that the group of men would legally call the collective of women their wives. The actual sexual relationships may be, to a point, fairly intimate and private. But every now and again, what happens with hunter-gatherers is as soon as they get the chance, the women take advantage of their rights with a number of different husbands. What happens with many South American native groups is that a woman will believe that her baby will do best if it has a lot of different dads. So when she is pregnant, she will choose extra males to father her baby. The argument is that the sperm from one man does not make a very strong fetus. And hey, no judgment, but it does leave me feeling a little confused on what our biological mating habits are. So what's the verdict? Here's what we know. Anthropologists can't agree on how, where, or why, but before our ancestors were recognizably human, we began pairing up in twos, and it likely happened with two furry faces locking eyes as one offered berries to another. How romantic. Almost every human society in history has examples of pair bonds that can be recognized as marriage, but they weren't good Christian monogamous either. Human societies were diverse, and if you can think of a sexual slash marriage arrangement, some human somewhere has tried it. Which is good for the more free-spirited types and the more traditional types, in that love exists across human culture. How it's expressed depends on the culture, but if you want to have sex with the same person for the rest of your life, more power to you. And more importantly for this video, the notion of a set in stone biological mating habit is bullshit especially the 80-20 split. Like I said, monogamish. The monogamy we know today wouldn't come until later. Fast forward to the Victorian era and we've been living with patriarchy for quite a while now. The fluid relations between the genders that we had when we were hunter-gatherers was heavily restricted and the once diverse set of mating habits became strictly monogamous. And this was the natural way of things because that's what it says in the Bible. I think I haven't read it in a long time. This is also where we see a lot of weird ideas about women. The dichotomy between the virgin and the whore, men owning their wives, it was all bad. For the wealthy, who you ended up with was basically a family matter, as your individual interests couldn't come before the interests of the family. So families would field a number of suitors for their daughters who got to come over for dates, with the daughter and the entire family there watching. It was a practice known as calling, and it sounds horribly awkward for everybody involved. Meanwhile, the working class had to do things a little bit differently. As people moved to cities to find factory work, young single men and single women would intermingle a lot more, in shops and at work. By 1900, almost half of American women were already working, often for a pittance of the wages men were earning. But as they crossed paths, a new phenomenon began to emerge. The dinner date. Suitors, often men, would ask people they liked, often women, to a night out at an eatery or a theater often at the man's expense. The conservative would argue that this is the natural way of human courtship. Males pursue, females choose. But there's a few reasons to believe this arrangement was cultural more than anything else. For starters, we had this thing called a uh, patriarchy where women weren't, you know, allowed to have power in society. And I feel like such a male feminist for saying that shit, but it's true. It, they literally could not afford to treat themselves to a night out, so they relied on suitors to enjoy any form of recreation or leisure. Gender roles and sexual standards were also incredibly restrictive, thanks in part to things like religion. So for a woman to be a pursuer of a sexual relationship was a big no-no. While today we view the dinner date as the traditional way of romance, back in the day, authorities were alarmed. Police agencies suspected that dating was nothing more than sex work. After all, if you pay someone for sex, it's illegal, but pay for their ticket to the theater and then suddenly it's not? Add in that all these young people were loitering out at night and it offended Victorian era sensibilities. Ultimately, these vice investigations weren't able to criminalize dating, but their hunch wasn't all wrong. Dating does feel weirdly transactional sometimes, right? Men are expected to pay and provide, and women are expected to put out. 
even 100 years later, these expectations are alive and well. It's a dynamic both men and women seem to complain about, so what's the deal? Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism is the catchy title of a book by American ethnographer Kristen Gazi. In it, she argues that the sexual economists who reduce dating, sex, and love to market behavior might actually be onto something. They're wrong in claiming their view of sex is the natural state of things, but she argues that under a capitalist economy like ours, sex, and by extension dating and relationships, are inherently transactional. When you live in a market economy without strong economic safety nets or community support and are expected to make it by any means necessary, your body becomes just another tool in your arsenal to get ahead. And this makes relationships worse for everybody. This is a sentiment echoed by Marx and Engels over a century ago, that capitalism reduces everything into a selfish calculation. The bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil and has reduced the family relation to a mere money relation. In other words, nothing is sacred to capitalism. The family was now not bonded by love, but by money. In the Victorian era, love and relationships were obviously money relations. You married the people your parents wanted you to because it preserved your family estate or whatever the fuck. When dinner dates first became a thing, women would often say yes out of self-interest. After all, they couldn't afford a night out at the theater on their own. And we already went over how the idyllic marriages of the 50s were economic arrangements that often left the wives miserable. But today? No way! We live in an enlightened age. We live in a post-sexual revolution world. We pair up and marry due to love and nothing else. No market here, right? Right? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to give a few points to the insults here. I know, I know, but think about it. We infinitely expanded the dating pool by liberating sexual norms and creating new dating technology, while simultaneously reducing our sense of community and generating unprecedented levels of loneliness. Connection, and by extension love, was now paradoxically closer and farther than ever. It seems that the quality of relationships have diminished while the quantity have gone way, way up. And I think this is experienced by the common dater as a lack of commitment, a lack of emotional intimacy, and genuine connection in relationships. These are the common complaints you see online in articles and forum postings everywhere. In this world of quick, shallow relationships, markers like attractiveness and wealth play an outsized role in dating. And the science seems to agree. Men and women, but women especially, are sensitive to wealth indicators in potential mates. This undoubtedly hurts straight hetero men in a unique way. All the cultural expectations for the man to be the provider are still mostly there, but wages have stagnated for decades. To illustrate just how closely intertwined the economy and relationships are, research has found that in places where the number of factory jobs shrank, women were less likely to get married. They also tended to have fewer children, though the share of children born to unmarried parents and living in poverty grew. What was producing these trends, the researchers argue, was the rising number of men who could no longer provide in the ways they once did, making them less attractive as partners. Furthermore, many men in these communities became no longer available, sometimes winding up in the military or dying from alcohol or drug abuse. This arrangement also hurts women in unique ways. Now they're expected to work on top of doing the majority of domestic work at home. But all this to say that the sexual economists did have a point in that in our individualist, hyper-consumerist society, dating is incredibly transactional. We find the logic of the market everywhere. But this is where we need to put our foot down before falling headfirst into black pill logic. Why wouldn't both men and women take money into consideration when it comes to dating? The double income has basically become necessary to afford life anywhere. It's inevitable that income and wealth are going to factor into dating. Why wouldn't people try to date up? Why wouldn't people use their bodies and charm to their advantage? It's a consequence of the society that we live in, not one specific gender or what some of these online commentators will try to get you to believe. Here's the unfortunate reality. 
Romance is a world rife with inequality. Some people are born with shit genetics, they're ugly, they're awkward. That's just how it goes. But this isn't an inequality we can solve. You see a poor person starving on the street and sure, it's reasonable to think we should do something about it. But you won't catch me writing a video essay on how men who get no bitches deserve a redistribution of sex. While we might criticize the logic of survival of the fittest when it comes to wealth and equality, attraction often is just survival of the fittest. Romancing a potential partner can be tough. One wrong move takes you from charming to Joe from you. Love is a world of haves and have-nots, and that's okay. Incels make a mistake by essentializing their bad luck in romance. It's genetics, they say, and there's nothing you can do about genetics. And while this is a mistake and there's a lot you can do to make yourself appealing even if your deck is stacked against you, there are grains of truth in that, yeah, you either bag someone or you don't. And the sexual inequalities are compounded by centuries of cultural baggage. Black women in the United States have got it the toughest when it comes to finding a partner. Asian women, meanwhile, have been fetishized quite heavily and have it the easiest. Men are expected to pursue and foot the bill, while women are expected to put out the more money a man throws at them. In this dating marketplace, using terms like low value and high value start to make a little sense. Not because if you consider yourself low or high value, that means that's something essential to who you are, but because living in the society that we do, men who make more money, who are more traditionally masculine and so on, are valued higher than men who aren't. Women who are more conventionally attractive are valued higher than those who aren't. And when you really start to think about the ways you don't fit that perfect mold and how the deck is stacked against you dating wise, yeah, it can feel pretty unfair. It can suck. If you love without evoking love in return, if through the vital expression of yourself as a loving person, you fail to become a loved person, then your love is impotent. It is a misfortune. This pain can be corrosive. It's what gets people to start thinking in terms of man versus women, and we can see its effects in the elders of the world, who turn that hurt outward and kill innocent people. This is the part of the video where the motivational music would start playing and I'd say something like, but if you just work on yourself, you go to the gym, have an appealing personality, you'll find someone right for you. Which is honestly true. Attraction is honestly 90% personal chemistry if you're seriously dating and not just hooking up at the club or something. But you've heard all that before. And it doesn't seriously solve this issue. So that's why we need government mandated wives for every- As Kristen Godsey explores in her book, this isn't an issue of men versus women. It's, and say it with me everybody, it starts with the letter C, it's capitalism, baby. And there's some empirical evidence to prove it. The 20th century Soviet blocs of countries were incredibly diverse and flawed, but the lessons we can draw from this era are endless, starting with gender dynamics. To some extent or another, these countries embarked on a policy of gender equality far sooner than their capitalist counterparts providing maternity leave to workers that in some countries extended as long as eight months of maternity leave, state-sponsored daycare programs, strong social safety nets, and so on. These programs were aimed at lifting women up to equal standing with men and allowing them to pursue education and work without having to become housewives. The programs were far from perfect, but they were way better than what the capitalist countries were offering, especially at the time. Researchers who have looked at relationships and sexual practices in the midst of these policy changes between the Soviet bloc and the Western bloc have found that sex was a lot better for the Reds. The East Germans created a situation in which women were no longer dependent on men, giving them a sense of autonomy that encouraged more generous male behavior in the bedroom. If capitalist West German girlfriends and wives were unhappy with the sexual performance of their male partners, they had a few options open to them, because women relied on men to support them financially. At best, they could gently try to nudge their partners into being more attentive to their needs. In the East, men who desired sexual relations with women could not rely on money to buy them access, and had incentives to improve their behavior. 
Divorce in East Germany was relatively simple and had few financial or social consequences for either partner. Both marriage and divorce rates were far higher than in the West. And the argument goes that these figures reflected a beneficial desire for marriages based on love. Stale, unsatisfying relationships could be readily dissolved and productive ones easily begun. The fact that women instigated the majority of divorce proceedings was heralded as a sign of their emancipation. Unlike in the West, women were not forced by economic dependence to stay in marriages they no longer enjoyed. In the words of the Polish sexologists, even the best stimulation, they argued, will not help to achieve pleasure if a woman is stressed or overworked or worried about her future and financial stability. Similar to the line taken by the East Germans, socialist sex was supposedly better because women enjoyed greater economic security, and because sex was less commodified than in the capitalist West, and because men weren't paying for it, they perhaps cared more about their partner's pleasure. Socialist states promoted the idea that sexuality should be disentangled from economic exchange, and they openly claimed that this made relationships more authentic and honest than in the West. When the Iron Curtain fell, the economic despair re-cemented transactional relationships. If you've heard or seen the trope of Russian mail-order brides, that's all due to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in the now reunited Germany, citizens felt enormous anxieties about the loss of jobs and social security, rising rents and uncertain futures, and articulated the conviction that sex in the East had been more genuine and loving, more sensual and more gratifying, and less grounded in self-involvement than West German sex. Of course, relationships aren't all about sex, but it seems that in attempting to separate the economy from love, some Eastern Bloc countries were able to strengthen relationship satisfaction. For the conservative spokesman, gender equality was what caused our current predicament. Women entered the workforce, women became too loose, their feminism ruined relationships, love, and the family. But as we can see with the Reds' basic attempts at equality, if done right, equality doesn't hurt relationships, it only helps them. And without the stress of having to meet your basic needs or depending on someone else to provide them for you, sex, relationships, and most importantly, love can flourish. But is love dead until we can fix the system? I don't think that even in the modern age that love and romance are dead. It sure is difficult to find, but hasn't it always been? Maybe that's just the fickle nature of it. Always on the horizon, but always difficult to grasp. The road to love has gotten longer for many, but as we can learn from the Reds, loving genuinely without ulterior motives seems to be the recipe for a fulfilling relationship, or at least a good time. Thanks for watching, and good luck out there.